اذا لا شك بان دبي هي مدينه الجمال والابتكار والتالق والتميز مجرد النظر الى مثل هذه الصوره الفنيه نتاكد باننا دائما الرقم واحد في كل شيء سواء في الابتكار العطاء التميز التالق حتى في التفكير العميق في حياتنا بشكل عام أه ذكرنا اذا التفكير خلونا نبدا جلستنا الثانيه والختاميه لهذا اليوم مع الابتكار في العاب العقل مجرد التفكير في الموضوع اكيد راح يكون في توتر كيف يعني العاب العقل خلونا نستقبل جيسون سيلفا مذيع تلفزيوني ومتخصص في العاب العقل بليز ويلكم ان ستيج هاي ايفريبادي هاوز ات جوين Thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor to be here at the Knowledge Summit in Dubai. It's actually my fourth visit to Dubai and it's always a wonderful experience. The city is just so impressive. It's amazing to see what's happening here in innovation, imagination and creativity. So, as some of you might know, I am the host of Brain Games on the National Geographic channel, and Brain Games is a television show that plays with our perceptions and our misperceptions of reality. And today I want to talk about our perceptions and misperceptions when it comes to innovation and technology. So, I'm very passionate about human creativity. I'm very passionate about human imagination. And this has turned to a passion for technology and innovation with a capital I. And the reason is because I believe that innovation and technology are the literalization of human creativity. Human imagination, right? Technology and innovation is the embodiment of human imagination. Technology and innovation is how we impregnate the world with mind, with agency, with our vision and with our creativity. Just look at the city of Dubai. I mean the city of Dubai, the topography of the city of Dubai is the condensation of human imagination. It's human imagination turned into concrete. It's human imagination spilled out from our heads out into the world. And so we use our tools, we use our technologies to overcome our limits. Humans have this innate capacity to create tools to extend the boundaries of who we are. And we've been doing it for the entire history of the human species. 100,000 years ago in the savannas of Africa, early humans from the first time that they picked up a stick to reach a fruit on a really high tree. We've been using our tools, our technologies to extend our reach, to extend our agency and our will. That is what we do. We've always done it. When we first started using stone tools, our jaws shrank. We build the tools and the tools change us in return. When man first discovered fire and cooking, cooking and fire acted as an external stomach that predigested our food making every meal more efficient freeing up the cognitive real estate for the emergence of culture creativity and art so our tools and our technologies have always been a part of who we are and perhaps the difference is that today we're living in a time of exponential technological change but our brains evolved in a world that was linear and local and that's the reason why technological change why disruption with a capital D is so difficult for us to wrap our heads around because again our intuition our instinct is linear 100,000 years ago we had to make a linear calculation how far away is that lion before it comes over here and eats me so again our intuition is linear but we don't live in a linear world anymore we live in a world that is global and that is exponential technology evolves at an exponential rate so how to illustrate what is meant by exponential change well there's a very good example used by the futurist and inventor ray kurzweil who's the head of engineering at google now and ray kurzweil uses the famous 30 steps example to illustrate the difference between linear change and exponential change. If you take 30 linear steps, 1 2 3 4 5, by step 30 you get to 30, right? That makes sense. 
30 linear steps, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you get to 30. Take the same amount of steps exponentially, and you would go 2, 4, 8. But by step 30, you know where you are? At a billion. Think about that for a second. 30 linear steps gets you to 30. 30 exponential steps, which is the speed of technological progress, gets you to a billion in the same amount of steps. These exponential growth curves of technology are the reason that the smartphone in our pockets today is a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful than what used to be a $60 million supercomputer that was half a building in size 40 years ago, and you needed special permissions to get access to it. So what used to be half a building in $60 million now fits in your pocket. Well, this is a million times cheaper and a thousand times more powerful. So the supercomputers of yesterday are now in everybody's hands. The tools to change the world are now in everybody's hands. A young kid in Africa with a smartphone today has better communications technology than a head of state had 25 years ago. Literally. Individuals today have the computational power that only governments and corporations used to have 25 years ago. In fact, we have even more. Bill Clinton wrote a cover in Time Magazine cover story called A Case for Optimism. And in it, he cited a 2010 United Nations development study that said that the smartphone was perhaps the greatest invention in history to pull people out of poverty. And it is these exponential technologies, it is these supercomputers in our pockets that have transformed the world and will continue to transform it still. Because these exponential curves, Moore's Law as they call it, is not stopping. It's continuing to compound. In the next 25 years, these things will shrink to the size of a blood cell. They'll be in our bodies and brains, interfacing with our neurons, extending our intelligence, extending our cognitive tentacles, and further reverse engineering us from inside out. So this is what's coming. And I think it's very exciting. Now, some people feel a bit apprehensive because certainly the speed of change continues to accelerate. We are evolving our own evolvability. And so part of what I've been trying to do is to create media, to create short form media, to inspire people to see these disruptions, to see these transformations as unique opportunities in history to address the grand challenges of humanity. Embodied in the principles of a summit like this, embodied in the principles of a place like Dubai, a place that believes that anything is possible because everything is possible. So I want to walk you through some of these videos today, these philosophical shots of espresso, to try to frame these disruptions and these technological transformations in an optimistic way. We see a lot of doom and gloom in the media. We see a lot of alarmism in the media. And I know why. It's because our brains have overactive amygdalas. The amygdala is like the alarm system of the brain. It's the fight or flight survival part. It's the alarm. And the reason that we pay attention to negative news in the media, whether it has to do with technology or conflict, we only focus on the negative, is because our amygdalas helped us survive 100,000 years ago, right? We are the descendants of those that were the most worried because those that were not got eaten by the lions, you know? And so there's a reason why we have a negative bias, why we pay attention to negative news. But the truth is, we've never had such innovation, we've never had such opportunity, we've never had such transformation, and this is really the case that I want to make for you guys today. So the first video that I want to show you is on the unique human capacity that we have to overcome our boundaries, to overcome our limits. As the cognitive philosophers David Chalmers and Andy Clark wrote, technology is a scaffolding that we use to overcome our thoughts, our reach, and our vision. So let's show the first video. To be human is to be transhuman, please. There's a great line by Shakespeare in which he says, We know what we are. We know not what we may be. 
And in the age of accelerating technologies in which we extend the cognitive reach of our minds, the perimeters of our humanness with these extensions of self, these exoskeletons, these technological scaffoldings, you know, the wings of our aircrafts and the signals traveling through our smartphones, sending our thoughts electrified at the speed of light across oceans of sky. We redefine and extend what it means to be human. Edward O. Wilson says, we have actually decommissioned natural selection, and now we must look deep within ourselves and decide what we wish to become. We are now the chief agents of evolution. We have reverse engineered the software of biology and are about to rewire and upgrade and redefine what it is to be a homo sapien. Juan Enriquez uses the term homo evolutus, the being that evolves itself, that transforms itself, right? Ray Kurzweil, we didn't stay in the caves, we haven't stayed on the planet. Biology is just another membrane to be transcended. You know, Marvin Minsky used to say, will robots inherit the earth? Yes, they will, but they will be our children. You know, I love this idea because we hear the term transhumanism, and what it means to be human is to be transhuman. We are the species that transforms and transcends. We never stop. We always did. It's what we are. So, thank you. So, we begin by talking about exponential technological progress, and I've given you the 30 steps example. I've talked about the smartphone in our pocket, the computational power, the supercomputers, the instruments that we have for transformation in our pockets. Now, I give these speeches all over the world, and most audiences, they hear the exponential message, and they're like, okay, when it comes to information technology, when it comes to digital, we buy the exponential change because we've seen it over the past 30 years. But certainly the physical world, right, the world made of matter and of concrete can't possibly be changing exponentially, right? That because it's not digital. But it turns out, my friends, that the world of flesh and the world of concrete is also becoming an information technology. So you guys are familiar with the term biotechnology. Biotechnology means mastering the information processes of biology, because biology is software. Biology is code. We are alphabetic beings all the way down. DNA is a language, and we can now start to write and edit and script that language. With biotechnology, we have software that writes its own hardware. With synthetic biology, the canvas of life, the software, the substrate of life itself becomes the new artist's canvas, becomes the new space for the engineers and the poets and the creatives to rewrite, to upgrade. Just like you download the new iOS on your iPhone, we're going to be able to download new software for our genes so not only will we be able to reprogram our bodies away from disease, but we might even eliminate aging. Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, just started the California Life Extension Company. It's a software company for biology that's going to leverage the revolution that we're going to see in healthcare and biotech over the next couple of decades. The eminent physicist Freeman Dyson envisions a very near future where a new generation of artists and engineers will be writing genomes the way that with the fluency that Blake and Byron and Shakespeare used to write verses. Biology is our new playground. What are we going to make? Gene sequencing, the speed at which we can sequence our genomes, is accelerating three times faster than Moore's Law. Three times faster than those exponential curves I was talking about before with our smartphone. So the speed at which this biotechnology revolution is coming is going even faster than exponential. We're not talking 100 years from now. We're talking maybe 10, maybe even less than that. It's going to change the game. People talk about medical tricorders, smartphone-sized devices that can diagnose our health better than 10 board-certified doctors. 
lab on a chip technologies, entire medical laboratories on smartphone sized devices that can be deployed in rural villages all over the world, transforming the capabilities and the access to health care, the quantified self revolution putting sensors in our bodies to monitor our blood, to monitor our systems, to monitor our organs in real time, feed that information to our computers so our computers can then advise us on lifestyle changes to extend our life. All of this is coming, and all of it is coming exponential. The next IT revolution is biology. Then you have nanotechnology. So nanotechnology allows us to pattern atoms the building blocks of the physical world, atoms, the way we pattern ones and zeros in digital. So just like in digital, ones and zeros can be manipulated to create the magic of the digital revolution, with nanotechnology, all of a sudden, the physical world made of atoms becomes programmable. Self-assembling nanotechnology means that we can create a piece of, piece of, a piece of software that tells the hardware around it what to do. Nanotechnology already exists in nature. When you plant a seed and it turns into a tree, the seed is an information file that tells the soil around it to turn into a tree. So nanotechnology in our hands means, again, software that can write its own hardware, information files that can tell a building to self-create itself. And nanotechnology is also progressing exponentially. The new skyscrapers in Dubai might be information files designed in a computer and you press print and the building makes itself. This is what's coming. So when you have these overlapping revolutions simultaneously emerging exponentially, you have biotechnology, changing healthcare, changing the way we fight illnesses, perhaps even making humans live twice as long. You have nanotechnology turning the physical world into a programmable medium. And then you have AI and artificial intelligence continuing to advance exponentially, non-biological props and scaffoldings, non-biological minds that can merge with ours, extending our intelligence even more. These three overlapping revolutions, GNR, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics, will change the world in a way we cannot even imagine. I think perhaps only art and only poetry can envision how the world might change on the back of these new super tools, these new construction kits for our reality. And this is what's coming. Trying to predict what this might look like is like trying to explain to a chimpanzee the beauty of a Shakespeare play or the nuances of a Pablo Neruda poem. I mean, a chimp is really intelligent, but he's not going to get the references that make Shakespeare poetic. And until we augment ourselves with these technologies, it's impossible to imagine what we might turn into. But it's going to be grand. And so on that, let's show the next video, the future of us. So let's talk about the future of us. What does that even mean, the future of us? It's a look at what comes next. It's a look at what might be. Because today, Exponentially emerging technologies are transforming what's possible. They are helping us overcome, transcend even biological limitations. The very rules of what it is to be human are up for grabs. We're rewriting the software of life with biotechnology. We're turning matter into a programmable medium with nanotechnology. We're creating sentient minds with artificial intelligence that are not bound by the limitations of biology. These three overlapping revolutions, GNR, genetic nanotechnology and robotics, together will be leveraged to lead us towards a black hole like impossible to fathom singularity. It's like staring into the sun. A moment of a rousing symphonic climax when all of mind leverages the network together, transcends its biological origins, and we become something more. People worry about the AIs and the them. Well, as Kurzweil says, that's going to be us. The future of us is ours to dream up. I Thank you. I really do believe we have to dream bigger than we've ever dreamed before. 
Because these new toolkits are giving us a canvas that we've never had, an opportunity that we've never had to address the grand challenges of humanity, to alleviate suffering, to extend creativity, to create new forms of human expression, new forms of human beauty, new forms of human art that we cannot even imagine. Kevin Kelly, the co-founder of Wired Magazine, wrote a wonderful book called What Technology Wants. And he talks about technology as the seventh kingdom of life. He calls technology the technium. He says it's an organism that has the same evolutionary forces as biological evolution. He says technology has a directionality. Technology wants more creativity, more expression, more art, more curiosity, more wonderment. These new toolkits extend the very best of our humanness. Now, there's still a kind of vibe out in the world, an apprehension about our techno culture. People still feel that maybe we're over relying on our technology. There's this assumption that technology is fundamentally artificial or separate. But another line that Kevin Kelly uses is everything is a technology. Language is a technology. Reading is a technology. The alphabet is a technology. The heart that pumps blood through our bodies is a technology. The brain is an electrical system. We have technology within our skin tissue, too. So making a distinction between the born and the made is a bad question to ask. Because if it's allowed by the laws of physics, if it's made of atoms, then it's natural. If we're making it and it's extending our capacities, then it's good. Imagine how impoverished the world would be if we didn't invent the technology of oil painting in time for Vincent van Gogh's genius to use that technology to express his beauty. Or if we didn't invent the technology of musical instruments or annotation, all technologies, in time for Beethoven and Mozart to take that instrument and express their beauty. What new technologies will come online in the future that will allow for new forms of human beauty to express itself? This is what we must facilitate. This is our responsibility. And for those that still think that technology is somehow unnatural, this next video is for you. This next video shows you how the more that we study natural systems and the more sophisticated our technological systems become, the more the technological systems start to be mirrors and reflections of natural systems. The very complexity that we create starts to look a lot like the natural world, showing us that it is part of the natural world because we are of nature and what comes out of us is of nature too. So let's show patterns, please. You know, there's a mind-expanding idea that smashes the false duality between nature and technology. The realization that nature and technology are one and the same, a continuum, smack in the middle between the born and the made, is summed up in the lines, to understand is to perceive patterns. That moment when the dots connect, you see the gestalt, the long view, and you see the big picture. This notion of patterns, for example, Paul Stamets has written about the mycelial archetype and how the information sharing systems that comprise the internet, a man-made system, mirror the neurons in our brain, a natural system, which in turn mirror computer models of dark matter in the universe. They all share the exact same intermingled filamental structure. It's unbelievable. Or for example, the fact that forager ants, when they hunt for food, their patterns of hunting mirror the TCP IP protocols that govern information flow of traffic on the internet. Same pattern. Jeffrey West from the Santa Fe Institute tells us that cities are actually like organisms. They have metabolic rates and that alleys are like capillaries. Fly an airplane. Look at a city from the sky. It looks like a motherboard. It looks like a microchip. Information arranged. Evolution, life, sentience, mind. To understand is to perceive these patterns. There is no duality between nature and technology. It is all one and the same. Thank you. You know, when I started doing these videos, I tell people that the inspiration was to spread a message of optimism, to spread a message of hope, to spread a message of curiosity and wonderment and science. And these videos started as a passion project. I started doing them self-funded, putting them on the Internet, and very soon they exploded virally. Within a few months, I was giving speeches all over the world. 
I became friends with the director, Ron Howard, who became a huge fan of these. I was invited to Richard Branson's Island to speak about innovation because he became a fan of these. So my entire life has changed on the back of this message. And I think ultimately it's a message. I'm not the only one saying it. This stuff is talked about at the TED conference. It's talked about at forums of knowledge around the world. It's talked about here at places like Dubai that understand that we need to be optimistic about the future, that we need to be excited about how we use these tools to extend the range of the possible. And Stephen Johnson, who's one of my favorite writers, he wrote a book on innovation called Where Good Ideas Come From, A Natural History of Innovation. And in the book, he cites this concept known as the adjacent possible. The adjacent possible is what exists in the perimeters of possibility. And he describes the adjacent possible as a shadow from the future that hovers, that floats over the now. And it provides a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. So the adjacent possible is like a filter, like a lens that you put on that tells you to look at problems as opportunities, that tells you to look at the present as a future possibility. And it's a wonderful application to start using. It's a wonderful cognitive shift because it tells us that everything good and great begins at the edge of our comfort zone. It's when we leave familiar habits, familiar patterns of thought, and move away towards the perimeters of possibility and take a risk and be willing to make ourselves a little bit uncomfortable for the sake of thinking differently. Once the mind is stretched by a new idea, it never returns to its original position. And this is what I love about this notion of the adjacent possible. And this is why I make these videos. As the philosopher Tom Robbins says, you can't manufacture imagination and innovation and wonderment, but what you can do is pull yourself so dramatically out of context, out of your comfort zone, that you're forced to gawk, to marvel in amazement at all of these wonders of the world that sometimes we're conditioned to ignore. Because what's right in front of us, sometimes we're blind to. Just like we're future blind to the exponential change, sometimes we're blind to the miracles right in front of us. And so to celebrate this theme of the adjacent possible, I have another video for you. Let's show the adjacent possible. I'm very inspired by the idea of the adjacent possible that Stephen Johnson wrote about in his book, Where Good Ideas Come From. And he says that the adjacent possible is like a shadow future that sort of hovers over the present state of things. The adjacent possible is like a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. I love this idea because it implies a kind of built-in optimism in how we see the world. It sort of implies a different way of looking at things that is not held back, that will not be bound by what is, but that is always remixing, that is always reinventing, that is always looking at how we can transform the material properties of the present so that we can bring into being our virtual models, our imaginative vision. Because that's what human beings do. Imagination allows us to conceive of these delightful future possibilities and then literally pull the present forward to meet it. And increasingly powerful technologies are shrinking the lag time between what we can imagine and what we can create. The adjacent possible is a move that is accelerating. Our adjacent possible is increasingly being able to be instantiated in real time. We're time lapsing our capacity capacity to literally render our dreams into being. So for that reason, the adjacent possible rocks my imagination. Thank you. Now, something else that's happening, and it's happening very, very fast, is that the world is quickly becoming intelligent. You know, people talk about this concept of the Internet of Things. What does it mean, the Internet of Things? Well, it means that as our computational tools keep shrinking in size, as this keeps getting smaller, we have the capacity now to start putting sensors, computation, into everyday objects. Sensors in our refrigerators, sensors in our cars, 
sensors in our clothing, sensors in the malls that know when we walk into a store and can give us personalized recommendation because these sensors, these computers, these networks will know our taste, will know our preferences, will be able to predict what we want to do at any given moment. These algorithms will act as artificially intelligent assistants, helping guide us, helping us make decisions, sometimes pre-deciding for us to make it easier for us to move about the world. We're going to be augmented by the Internet of Things because the world is going to start giving us real-time feedback. You know, we're used to giving instructions out into the world. We're not used to getting feedback from everyday objects. We're not used to having our car talk to us or our refrigerator telling our car that we have to buy more milk on the way home and then our car self-driving itself to the supermarket to make sure that we get milk. But the Internet of Things is the next hotbed of innovation. All the big keynotes, all the big conferences for Cisco, for Qualcomm, for IBM, everybody's talking about the Internet of Things. When intelligence spills out of the computer, spills out of the smartphone, and starts to appear everywhere. And this next video provides a look at how the Internet of Things will re-enchant the world and make everything magical. Let's show it. So one of the next big tech revolutions that everybody's talking about these days is the notion of the Internet of Things. See, now that we are extending intelligent sensors into everything, into the world of everyday objects, all of a sudden these objects are going to be endowed with agents. They're going to be endowed with the ability to give us feedback. The world is going to become intelligent and responsive and going to anticipate our needs. The world is going to feel like an extension of our mindedness. When everything becomes linked with everything else, as Eric Davis used to say, Matter becomes mind. You know, David Rose in his new book, Enchanted Objects, essentially says that we're moving back into a world of animism where objects have actual agency. They actually have a kind of consciousness and that things almost are enchanted, almost are alive. You know, you walk into a room and the room knows how you like the lighting and the song that you love starts automatically playing and the curtains automatically raise and the computer offers you your favorite snack. I mean, the full flourishing of these technologies promises to essentially blur the distinction between self and world. The entire world will have mind in it. It's how the cognitive philosophers David Chalmers and Andy Clark used to say, we've always been adept at dovetailing our minds to our tools. But when our tools start talking back, the loop will be finished. We will have fully spread our minds out into our universe. This is the Internet of Things. This is why it's a game changer. And this is why it absolutely rattles my imagination. So, you know, read up on it, right? It's coming. (laughs) So, one of the key themes, you know, behind all this talk about technology and disruption and opportunity is presented to you today, you know, from my angle of this lens of human imagination, this idea that we can do anything. And I'm really interested in reaching people of all ages, you know, students all the way to grandparents, to tell you that you have to believe that anything is possible, that curiosity, that imagination, that science, that wonderment, that awe, that's what it's all about. And I call these videos shots of awe because of some science that came out of Stanford University that I think you'll find very interesting. So the university studies described awe as a feeling of such perceptual expansion, an experience of such perceptual vastness, that you're forced to create new models in your brain of the world in order to assimilate, in order to comprehend what you're seeing. 
So maybe the first time you saw the space telescope images of the universe, or the first time you saw the Burj Khalifa, or the first time you saw an Emirates A380. You've never seen something like that before, and so you're, you're left mouth open with a state of wonder and awe, and your brain is taking in a new model. You're being updated by the experience. And these moments of awe, of curiosity, of inspiration, after they pass, it turns out that they leave us with increased feelings of well-being, increased feelings of creativity, and increased feelings of compassion. So every time we do something amazing, every time we're exposed to something we've never seen before, after the experience passes, it leaves us with all this feel-good vibe, creativity, compassion. We're more innovative afterwards. And additionally, these experiences of awe act as anti-inflammatories in our bodies. So it's actually physically healthy for us and aids our creative thinking every time we push the boundaries in terms of what we expose our brains to. And this is really inspiring to me because this is what I want to leave you with when you think about innovation and technology and imagination is that sense that anything is possible, that sense of awe, that sense of infinite, boundless possibility. So let's show the video on awe, please. <laughs> I think a lot about the contrast between banality and wonder, between disengagement and radiant ecstasy, between being unaffected by the here and now, being absolutely ravished emotionally by it. And I think one of the problems for human beings is mental habits. Once we create a comfort zone, we rarely step outside of that comfort zone. But the consequence of that is a phenomenon known as hedonic adaptation. Overstimulation to the same kind of thing, the same stimuli again and again and again, renders said stimuli invisible. Your brain has already mapped it in its own head, and you no longer literally have to be engaged by that. We have eyes yet see not, ears that hear not, and hearts that neither feel nor understand. There's a great book called The Wondering Brain that says that one of the ways that we elicit wonder is by scrambling the self temporarily so that the world can see through. And what Henry Miller says is a blade of grass, when given proper attention, becomes an infinitely magnificent world in itself, you know? Darwin said attention, if sudden and close, graduates into surprise, and this into astonishment, and this into stupefied amazement. That's what rapture is. That's what illumination is. That's what that sort of infinite, comprehending awe that human beings love so much. And so how do we do that? How do we mess with our perceptual apparatus in order to have the kind of emotional and aesthetic experience from life that we render most meaningful? Because we all know those moments are there. Those are the moments that will make final cut. Only in these moments we experience afresh the hardly bearable ecstasy of direct energy exploding on our nerve endings. This is the rhapsodic, ecstatic, bursting forth of awe that expands our perceptual parameters beyond all previous limits. And we literally have to reconfigure our mental models of the world in order to assimilate the beauty of that download. That is what it means to be inspired. The Greek root of the term means to breathe in, to take it in. We fit the universe through our brains and it comes out in the form of nothing less than poetry. We have a responsibility to awe. Thank you. So I remember the other night there was a brief conversation about Singularity University. Singularity University was created by Google, NASA, and Ray Kurzweil, the futurist that I mentioned earlier. And Univer Singularity University acts as a think tank, as a university inviting grad students to learn about exponential technologies. So students come in and they learn about robotics and computation and biotech and nanotech and essentially to learn how to think exponentially. That's the key idea here. Because once you start to think exponentially, the impossible becomes possible. The out of reach becomes within reach, but it requires a cognitive shift. It requires a change in our intuition. We have to rewire 
our brains to really truly understand and grapple with the implications of exponential thought. And every graduating student from Singularity University is tasked with coming up with a project, a company, an invention that can positively impact a billion people. This is the ambition that they ask of students at Singularity University. That's the scale of thinking that they are inviting. Not how to affect 10 people, not how to affect 20 people. How can you, each one of you, as an individual, come up with an idea that can positively impact a billion people? I think this is incredibly inspiring. And so I created a video under this concept of redefine billionaire, which has been put out there by a couple of people. But the basic idea is that in the 21st century, those of us who understand exponential technologies are calling to redefine the term billionaire. So that a billionaire does not necessarily mean somebody worth a billion dollars, but a billionaire is somebody who positively affects a billion people. That's the new definition of billionaire. And so I ended up launching the video with an amazing collaborator. We were profiled on Fast Company under the hashtag Redefine Billionaire. And the video ended up getting a million views, not quite a billion yet, but a million views on Facebook within a couple of days. And this is a very special video because I think this video sums up everything that I've told you today. You know, we've gone through the, the several steps of thinking exponentially, information technology, biotechnology, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, how these three things will transcend our space of possibility. We've talked about exploring the adjacent possible, the perimeters of the possible. We looked at the ways in which technology is just a reflection of us. It's just our minds turned inside out. It's just our minds extended out into the world. And we finally have looked at the Internet of Things and the power of curiosity and awe. So if I were to sum all of these things together, I would leave you with this message. We have the capacity to make this world a better place. Every single day, every single one of us, with the contributions that we make, can make this world a better place, can positively infect a billion people. And one of the key messages, of course, is that we can do this on the back of the supercomputers in our pocket. So this next video was actually shot with my iPhone, in, in Central Park in New York, and then edited with a friend. So it's actually an example of a message that can spread and to reach a million people shot and edited with a smartphone. So please, let's show Redefine Billionaire. We live in a world of exponential technological advancement. What this literally means is that we have new construction kits for our reality, new tools with which to probe at the adjacent possible. So consider the implications, right? As Marshall McLuhan used to say, first we build the tools, and then the tools build us. We are designed by what we have designed. There are these feedback loops of mind, tool, and world that radically redefine our boundaries, that radically transform what it means to be human. To be human today is to crisscross the skies. To be human today is to create techno-social wormholes, mind-to-mind communication that overcomes the limits of time, the limits of the time, time and this space. And so what do we do? Well, we need to radically reach out to one another in ways that we haven't before. There's a great line that says, Empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight. In other words, if it's out of sight, it is out of mind. But if anything, these wireless communication technologies are radically extending our line of sight. They're providing new ontological maps of the real. They're giving us the astronaut overview effect. We are seeing the big picture. We are seeing that we are the captains of spaceship Earth. And what shall we do? We need to extend our hands to one another. We've never had such tools to overcome all of the limitations of our humanity. We have the power, we have the will, we have the capacity, the creative capacity to overcome our limits. And so today, billions of us linking to one another, creating a global node, a global brain. What is the new definition of billionaire? The new definition of billionaire is he who will positively affect the lives of a billion people. He or she will reach out and say, I will positively affect the lives of a billion people. This should be our goal. This is our responsibility. Here's our chance. Thank you so much, guys. So uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. I'd love to turn this into a, a dialogue for the remainder of the session. So thank you so much for listening to my message. It's really an honor to be here with you guys here in Dubai, here at the Knowledge Summit. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. And love some questions. Hi. Hi. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about your all shots you were talking about. Mm -hmm. For you, it's all. For me, it's O. <laughs> For you, it's hope. For me, it's scary. Because, uh -huh. okay, I do get that we use technology and it's very important. But I'm really scared about this future that you're talking about. Uh -huh. if, we, if we won't need any more the, the other human beings. And, um, um, what will happen when we wait for the ship that's inside us to tell us about what's wrong with us? You know, we, it's just about the ship. There's no human connection. We will become robots then. I, I'm a bit scared about that. If you can explain what sure. will happen then when, sure. when we will be very... Um, Technology will be everything in our lives that will become robots and there will be no human interactions sure. and yes. everything Look, will be... I think, I think that your, your, your apprehension and your fear is something that I hear a lot. Just because it's all happening so fast, we don't have time maybe to digest and to assimilate these tools into the, how we function as individuals. But to give you some examples from the past, they might give you some perspective. So when writing was first invented, that was the technology. That was a disruptive technology. And Socrates, the Greek philosopher Socrates, used to say that writing was a negative technology because it was going to atrophy our brains because if people started writing everything down, they wouldn't remember anything. So he was against it. He thought, this is a very scary thing. It's going to make us into robots. Everybody's going to write everything down. Nobody's going to remember or think. So there's numerous examples in history. You know, when, when the radio first came online, people were like, it's going to make people crazy. The voice is coming out of the speaker. It's going to cause brain damage. They said the same thing of television. You know, naturally now, people say about the Internet, oh, it affects our learning and this and that. The truth of the matter is that technology is a double-edged sword. It extends our reach, but it can extend our reach in positive or negative ways depending on how we choose to use it. So fire... Fire changed humanity. There's a famous book called Cooking Made Us Human. Because fire, again, was an external stomach. It pre-digests food. It makes the nutrients in food more bio-bio-bio-available so that every meal is more efficient. Before fire, before cooking, we spent all day foraging for raw food. There was no time for culture, for art, for communication. It was all eating all the time. Fire changed that. But guess what? Fire can also burn our villages. Fire can also burn our enemies. Language, when used well, brings us all together, allows ideas to spread, allows the world to change. But language in negative ways, well, I mean, look at World War II. Look at the propaganda coming out of the Nazis. I mean, you know, language used in a bad way can incite people to violence. It can create all kinds of horrible things. So technology's always had two sides. And yet, this is where it gets interesting. People say, okay, so technology has two sides and technology is getting more powerful, so does that mean that there's going to be more horrible things happening in the future? But the truth of the matter is, and I recommend everybody look up Steven Pinker. So Steven Pinker did a TED Talk called The Myth of Violence. And he's an academic researcher that, look, he's an academic researcher that looks at violent trends from across the world over the decades. And his research, which is very counterintuitive if you watch the news, but he actually sets the actual numbers when you zoom out, when you look at the long view, when you look at the historical trends, violence across the world is actually the lowest point that it's ever been in all of human history on a global scale. Now, granted, we have global media and Twitter that can amplify all the wrongs in the world, and in a way that's good because it makes us address it. But the truth of the matter is that the chances of a man dying at the hands of another man today are the lowest than they've ever been in all of human history. This is something that's not talked about. And this is as technology gets faster and faster and faster and more part of our lives, we've been getting more and more and more and more, more peaceful, more and more and more and more, more civil. So I'm not, I'm not to say that correlation equals causation, but the irony is that in spite of these apprehensions about technology, we've become more civilized as globally minded human beings. Because time, space, and distance are no longer limitations for us. Because cultures can come together virtually. Because people can meet each other across the internet. Distance no longer matters. 
Now, some people have the concern that, well, we're staring at our phones all day and it's keeping us away from human-to-human interaction. Yes, I think that you could definitely overuse this at the expense of face-to-face interaction. But don't forget that this is temporary. Don't forget that in 20 years, this is going to go away. The computation is going to be in here. The chips are going to be in here. And that's not going to take us away from this world. It's just going to take the virtual world and put it on top of this one. It's called augmented reality. We'll have contact lenses that are connected to the Internet. And when we walk around the world and we think, I have a question, it'll automatically, in our brains, it'll go to Google or whatever the name of the search engine is, and it'll display the information in front of us without us having to look down at these square-shaped devices. So it's going to be a harmonious marriage of virtual and physical. Because don't forget, at the end of the day, and this is something we talk about on brain games, even the physical world is virtual. Culture is a virtuality. We all live inside of cultural reality tunnels. And only when you travel to a different culture do you realize, oh, wow, so this is like one virtual reality, this culture, another another culture is another virtual reality. Everything is a virtual reality. Language is a virtual reality. Our thoughts are limited by the words that we have in our brain. Language sculpts the way we think. Clothing can change our worldview. Even a cloudy day can make us more creative than a sunny day. So we're constantly influenced by environmental factors, not just technology. So, you know, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a broader perspective to alleviate some of your concerns. There's a lot more going on at any given moment. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Questions in the front here? Hi. Uh, Thank you for enthusiastic, encouraging, and amazing speech. Um, my name is Heba, I'm from Egypt. I just hi. wanted hi. I just wanted to share an example of humanitizing um, technology um, that you were talking about. It's an example of an, a UK charity organization that created a big uh, outdoor that, that uh, features faces of women um, with injure, injuries um, because of domestic violence. Hmm. And uh, it is the, the, the outdoor, the, the giant outdoor, is supported with a facial recognition software that wow. scan the audiences. So the more passerby stop in front of the ad and look at the women, the heels are gradually healed. Wow. So uh, the point of the look at me ad is um, the more we acknowledge, the more we notice the problem, so it will be solved. This is kind of using technology for um, social change yeah. in the world. Beautiful. That's it. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. That's amazing. Great example. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, It's interesting to see the enthusiasm and the expectations, you know, that we are putting through. However, at the year probably 1890, some people were asked, you know, sort of some 74 scientists were asked, you know, sort of how the world will be at the year 2000. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, you know, sort of wrote that, well, the um, male will go, you know, sort of through tubes full of air and, you know, sort of that's how, you know, the male will go very quickly. But the most interesting thing that somebody said that scientists should stop this silly idea of having machines flying on top of the air. This is against, you know, sort of the laws of physics. So what happened at the year 2000 has never been imagined at the year 1900. Right. And my question is, can we ever imagine, although, you know, sort of of your predictions, what will happen at the year 2100? Right. I guess nobody will be ever able to imagine how life will be there at this time. Yeah. And the most interesting point that the behavior of people, the selfishness, the aggression, and that sort of thing, probably may be the target of science and technology in the, in the next decade. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you for your question. It's true. It's, it's very hard to predict because just because we understand exponential tech doesn't mean we know exactly in what direction it will turn because it's still up to us and how we use these tools. That's part of the reason why I think that the art, the artists are so important 
because most of this stuff is talked about in academic environments, and a lot of time it's engineers saying this is going to look like this is going to look like that. But we all know, even if you look at Apple Computer, Steve Jobs was a philosopher. You know, he may have had a lot of engineers that built to his specifications, but he couldn't actually build any chips. He was just a philosopher and a dreamer. And the famous Apple campaign from the 80s was all about celebrating the, the artists and the rebels and the poets and those that dare to think differently. So I think historically we've had some figures that have been very accurate in looking at the future, and most of them have been philosophers. People like Marshall McLuhan in the 1960s, people like Timothy Leary, who was considered the most dangerous man in America by Nixon. But he was a countercultural revolutionary that predicted virtual reality, predicted the Internet, predicted intelligence amplification. So a lot of times I think we need to listen to those artists on the fringes because sometimes they are able to separate themselves enough from what they're seeing to imagine all the creative ways in which we could use these tools to change the world. But again, it doesn't mean we know because we can't possibly know exactly what we'll be like when we're amplified a thousandfold by computers in our brains. But, uh, you know, as, a, as an artist and as somebody who went to university for philosophy and film, I'm speculating based on existing trends. So I look at the data and I paint a painting or a poem. That's how I present these videos to people. They're poems for how the future might come into being based on real data, but nonetheless they are poems. Thank you for your question. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. That man uh, in the back, I see a hand. That gentleman, yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Azrael Abdarabia. Um, I'm, I'm actually thrilled by your presentation, and I think you managed uh, very well to present us with the opportunities involved with these exponential changes. My question is about the challenges Challenge. we're facing yeah. with those changes. Yeah. What, what do you think are the challenges facing today's executives, both in the private sector and even in government sector? What's yeah. your advice to these people? That's the first one. And the second question that I have is about the, um, what we call the artificial intelligence. Yeah. I think are we going to get to a point where we are going to replace the human cos consciousness? Is this a point where we get yeah. to that close? And thank good, you very much for your presentation. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the question was about the challenges, you know, because obviously I've, I've focused on the opportunities, but people often say, well, what are some of the challenges? Well, I'll tell you what's one challenge. Biotechnology, as I was mentioning, is going to give us the capacity to program off illnesses. Like when you have something wrong, you'll be able to like change the software and fix it like that. But it also means that an angry kid in the garage in Minnesota can make a synthetic pathogen and unleash a virus that could kill 100 million people. I mean, that's terrifying. Because just like you can use biotechnology to heal illnesses, you can make biotechnology to make viruses. It's pretty terrifying. I take some kind of hope in seeing that as our, tech, as our tools have gotten more powerful, we have a species has gotten, have gotten more peaceful. So that tells me that, yes, it's going to empower crazy people to do crazy things, but our ability to respond to that is also going to increase exponentially. Our capacity to neutralize that is going to increase exponentially. And I like to think that as a species, we're becoming more peaceful anyway. So these things will be addressed. But again, these things are not new. When we invented language, the challenge became who can use language to manipulate people to do violent things. So there's always been a problem. Um, and we have to be careful. And that's why it's very important how we use these tools. You know, I, my videos are shown at schools all over the world. Last time I was in Dubai, I was invited to the Dubai International School where they have a whole after-school club of shots of awe and they watch these videos and they organize a TEDx event. So I like to think that the more you reach young people, the more you teach them to think big and to dream that you can sort of address these things before they become a problem. And then your question about artificial intelligence, you're saying whether uh, human consciousness is going to be replaced. I don't think so. I think, in fact, when we call it artificial intelligence is also kind of a mistake. I think we should just call it intelligence. And it doesn't matter if it's software that runs on biological hardware or silicon hardware. And the truth of the matter is that intelligence is already distributed between both. When I use my phone, my intelligence, my mind is distributed in a network. 
in a feedback loop between brains, tools, and environments. I do a lot of my thinking in my phone. When I write things down, when I read what I wrote, it's creating a feedback loop so that if you really want to say, where's Jason's mind, Jason's mind is distributed between his brain and his iPhone and in his environment, and depending on what that environment is doing to influence his thinking. So I I don't think that we're going to replace human consciousness. I think that we're just going to further distribute it between biological and non-biological hardware. That's what I think. Thank you. In the front. Hello. I am Natalie from Jordan. Uh, My question is, uh, how will you be able to ensure that biotechnology could not be used for a bad cause? Like, how can we ensure that it's only for a good cause and we will not be using it for creating viruses, creating diseases, uh, yeah. doing destructive work. True. Like it's like the virus on computers. They invented the antivirus to protect True. our computers from being hacked. How can we ensure that this technology will not be used yeah. for it's a destructive purpose? No, I think it's going to be very similar to what we're seeing with hacking and cyber crimes today. I think that there's going to be mainstream culture and mostly, you know, the majority of biotechnology will be used for good. But there will always be people on the fringes that try to use it for bad and will probably have the equivalent of an antivirus for biotech. There will probably be companies that provide, you know, biological protection. You take a piece of software, a little nanotechnology thing that monitors for any synthetic pathogens that might be coming your way. I mean, we're going to have to deal with the fact that it is a double-edged sword. It always has been a double-edged sword. Maybe we'll have regulations for these toolkits. You know, maybe it won't be like a phone that everybody can buy it. Maybe it'll be like a car. You have to get a license. Or maybe it'll be like highly regulated gun control, like they have in the U.K., where it's not easy to buy a gun, you know. Like maybe it'll be something that has to be, we have to figure out who can play with biology. But we have to be careful not to overregulate it, because the cure to the worst illness might be solved by a student in Edinburgh. And if he doesn't have access to the tools, then how can we leverage his intelligence? So it's, you know, we're going to have to find a balance. So the ac- so the accessibility rate of uh, the accessibility rate of uh, reaching to such a technology will not be distributed among everyone. Sorry, I, d- I didn't hear that part. The accessibility yeah. of accessing such a technology yeah. will not be distributed or will, will not be equal to everyone and well, anyone. The truth is that the policy frameworks for biotechnology haven't been figured out. I mean, today in China they said they had the technology to clone a human. In the U.S., we still haven't figured out, like, what are the moral ethical concerns. We're going to have to deal with it. There's probably going to be the Knowledge Summit Dubai, you know, in two or three years where we're going to have this discussion, and it's going to be talked about. And what I would say is we have to be cautious, but we cannot be overcautious. We can't just ban this stuff because we're afraid of it, because that never works. We have to figure out what is the sensible way to leverage its potential and minimize its risk. In the front, this gentleman here. Bismillah. Assalamu Hi. Just I was speaking Arabic in Arabic. And you speak yeah. Arabic? Yeah. Oh, okay. We are in the past or in the past, in the past, in these years, there are big changes. And we see a new generation or a new generation الفترة وسوف تظهر إن شاء الله في الفترات اللاحقة بإذنه تعالى أريد أن أعرف ما هو مفهومك من خلال العروض الرائعة التي قدمتها عن الموضوع التكنولوجيا وكيف تتم أو منظور أو مفهوم المعرفة خلال من خلال هذه الأجيال لجعلها تبتكر أو خلقها أجيال مبتكرة للفترات القادمة بإذنه تعالى هذا هو السؤال It's a great question. The question was how, you know, based on the videos I've shown, based on my view of technology, how can we make sure that young people are more innovative? How can we get young people to think differently, to think big? I think that one great tool for this is the media. You know, I work for National Geographic. I host Brain Games. There is a reason why in the media we call content, we call the stuff that we make programming, because media programs our brains. Media 
patterns the imagination. Media tells us not just how to think, but what to think. And so I think that we have a responsibility in the media to make content that inspires the imagination. You know, not at the expense of normal entertainment, because normal entertainment is still really great and really fun, but content like what we make at National Geographic, like what we make in the world documentaries, nonfiction. We have a responsibility to make content that stretches our brains. I've started making these videos. I put them on YouTube. I put them on Facebook. They're free around the world. These videos are getting 800,000 views a week. And they're getting, I have, you know, half a million fans on Facebook alone. That means that, you know, people from all over the world, I have fans in Colombia, Venezuela, Iraq, Sudan, that are watching these videos and getting inspired. You know, people in, living in, in, in parts of the world where you, you're, not, you're not sure if they're getting access to this stuff are watching this stuff and getting excited about it. And they're going to grow up and they're going to make a contribution and they're going to start companies that are going to change their societies and change the world to, to make it even better. So I think that media is a key part of it. And I also think, you know, in educational context, I think schools need to be constantly open to getting better, to upgrading how they teach. You know, I went to the, uh, when I was growing up in Venezuela, I went to the Montessori school. The Montessori is a system of education that encourages individual passion. So if a student has a particular interest in one thing, you support it. You let the kid's passion shape what he ends up learning instead of trying to make everybody according to one standard. And I think that's also cool. Diversity is key. In the future, it's not about everybody working for the same company. It's about everybody thinking for themselves and collaborating. And that, I think, is another key message to put out there. So, thank you. Thank you. See a hand or, yeah, this gentleman. Microphone here in the front. This gentleman in the front, in the front. <laughs> She's bringing it to you. Thank you, my dear brother Silva. This thank is you. Again. Thank you. I can feel and read and see the enthusiastic and the passionate in your heart and on your gestures as well. Uh, my you. question, my, my brother Silva, how can we reduce the gap between the millennial generation and the maybe new boomers or 60? and the 60s or 70s or 50s generation who have different mentality regarding, and I can also feel and imagine the, your challenge here and there. Uh, number, uh, number, question number two, how can we also reduce the gap between the first world and the third world where we are struggling to find the food and water? Yeah. So please, if you don't mind, just Wonderful. to conclude our... Thanks for your question. So... The question was, how do you shrink the gap between the millennial generation and people born in an earlier time who, you know, might be, have a different way of seeing things? I think that one of the key things that we have to do is remind people we're all human and we're all in this together. You know, it's not about like, oh, I'm a millennial and you were born in the 50s and 60s. We're all a community and we, everybody brings wisdom. You know, the young people might bring a certain exuberance and excitement, but the older people bring a little bit maybe a caution, cautiousness and experience. You know, they're like, let's not go so fast. You know, together I think it creates a great balance. I think, again, media is a great way to extend hands. I get told a lot of times people that watch brain games, parents watch it with their kids. And they tell me it's one of the few shows that parents watch with their kids. So it's not just for children, it's not just for the older generation, it's for people working together. So I try to do that. I think that you can create content and put out messages that are cross-disciplinary and cross-generational in their appeal, you know, and I think that that's very important. I think some brands have done that well. I mean, Apple is something, you know, I was in the Apple store in New York, and I remember the, the employees range from people in their 70s to people in their 20s. I mean, there's literally a woman who's like 75 who's like there explaining how the iPhone works to another woman in her 60s, and it's like, cool. You know, that's a brand that has touched the hearts and the imagination of people of all ages. And I think that that's, you know, continues to be possible. We just got to nurture that. And then you ask about uh, the, the digital gap between the third world and the first world. You know, some people say these technologies are great, but they're only for the rich. What Ray Kurzweil answers to them, he says, yeah, you mean like the cell phone? So what he says is, yeah, at first these technologies are very expensive, but that's only when they don't work very well. The better they get, the cheaper they get. And today, you know, the, 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 the use of social media in the developing world is more pronounced even than in the developed world. 
places like Venezuela, countries that are practically sinking in devaluation and criminality, nonetheless have the highest usage of media. It's how the people get around uh, the government controlling the media in Venezuela. People want to get the news, they go on Twitter and Facebook. So it's like you see even amidst challenging parts of the world, people are figuring it out. People are using these tools. You see in some places where in the third world where we've seen uh, people shutting down networks to prevent the people from communicating. There's software now that allows phone-to-phone -phone communication without a mainstream network. Decentralized mesh networks. It's incredible. One of them is called FireChat. So if enough people have the FireChat app, it doesn't matter if the main carrier shuts down because of a natural disaster or because of anything. People can still communicate. So in the end, plurality and open communication is overcoming all the hurdles. And I think including the digital divide will be, will be overcome. Thank you. Here in the front and then that lady in the back afterwards. Wow, a lot of great questions. Okay. <laughs> this gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to address my questions in my uh, mother tongue language. Arabic? Arabic? Yes, please. Okay. Shukran uh, ala هذه المحاضرة القيمة فيما يتعلق باستشراف المستقبل في مجال التكنولوجيا سؤالي يتعلق بنوعية الجرائم التي يعني ستكون في المستقبل نتيجة تطبيق مثل هذه التكنولوجيا وكذلك يعني مواكبة القوانين والتشريعات المستقبلية فيما يتعلق بهذا الموضوع وهل سيكون هناك تأثير على العقل البشري في نموه فيما يتعلق أن إحنا سيكون اعتمادنا الكلي والأكبر على استخدام التكنولوجيا زمان كنا يعني نقوم بحل المعادلات الرياضية بناء على معادلات يدوية الآن بضغط زر نقدر نحصل على الإجابة يعني القدرات الذهنية العليا أصبحت محدودة باستخدام مثل هذه التكنولوجيات فما هو تعليقكم على هذا شكرا Thank you so much for your great question um, So yeah some of the, the questions were related to some of the challenges you know how do we regulate how do we build laws to address the abusive potential of these very powerful technologies you know, I often think that one of the industries that is a prime example where we still see innovation, we see a very powerful technology used incredibly safely around the world, and that's commercial aviation. Commercial aviation is something that to this day blows my mind. I mean, you get on a A380 and all of a sudden you cross an ocean through the sky? Really? With wife? I mean, it's like impossibly complex and marvelous aviation. 100,000 airplanes take off and land every day with perfect safety. They have technology to orient us through the sky at night, no matter the weather. It's really amazing. But aviation is highly regulated. There are very, 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 very strict global standards, and everybody has to meet those standards, and not everybody can have a pilot's license, and you have to pass a whole bunch of tests, and they make it very, very, very difficult so that you know that at the very top level you're doing something that's a very powerful technology, but it's extremely reliable for that reason. And some people say that that regulation has actually stopped innovation a little bit in aviation. You know, the aircrafts are very advanced, but they haven't gotten that much faster. They haven't flown that much higher compared to what's potentially possible. So I think it's about finding a balance. I do think that biotech is going to require regulation. I do think that we're going to have to figure out who gets to play with making viruses in a lab, for sure. That's not a game. That's not a toy. But at the same time, we have to make sure not to alienate those innovators for, by making the bar of entry too high. Because then if people feel discouraged to get into biotech because it's completely controlled, then where are the innovations going to come from? So I think it's a dialogue that has to continue to happen for a very long time. And I think that that's what we'll have to do. That's why these forums are so important. We, I think we can solve it together. That's what I think. I, in regards to your question about 
higher level mental functions. He said, you know, we used to do complex mathematical equations by hand. Now we do it with the press of a button. And so the question is, are we not using these deep faculties? It is a great question, and it's definitely something that makes a lot of sense. You're right. By not doing it on paper, we're not engaging certain faculties. But another thing to consider in broadening our definition of technology is even the paper and the pen were a technology in their day. Before we had the paper and the pen, the calculations had to be done just in our brain. And then we started using the paper and the pen, and we probably stopped using all the brain because we had the paper and the pen to help us. You're right. Now we just press a button, so it's even less effort. But I guess my point would be one thing gets replaced by computation. It opens up the space to develop something else. And you always have the option of teaching, you know, going to school, learning math manually before you use the smartphone. But maybe we'll get to a point where people are learning a new set of skills that computers can't do. I think there will always be something that is unique to biology, and we will continue to figure out what are the ways in which we can stretch those capacities. But nonetheless, I acknowledge that it, that is a concern. You know, that kids, if it's too easy to press a button, you're not really understanding how it works, and that can be a shame. I, I concede that for sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question. This lady over here. Two Hello? more questions, guys. Yeah. Two more questions. Um, actually, here, over here, Jason. Over Sorry. Here. Okay, you go I first. I have a quick question. Hi. Um, okay. If you can put the uh, Arabic translator, please. If Say you again? Put, if you can put the headphone on. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sultan al-Subhi. I've been talking about three languages in the name of Allah. I've been working in the University of Penn State in America. Uh, شكرا على اللقاء يعني المحاضره الجميله uh, سؤالين ورسالتين على الش... بشكل سريع uh, هي قمه المعرفه وانا كنت في uh, مثل المسابقه اللي احو... لاغناء المحتوى العربي في الانترنت اوف ثينجز اللي ذكرتها فسؤالي لك هي بالاول كيف ممكن ان نغني المحتوى العربي الرقمي بشكل فعال والشيء الثاني اللي كل شخص يعني موجود هنا في القمه سال أغلبهم أو إذا ما كان 95% هم عرب شكرا للدكتور اللي في الصف الأمامي والرجل في الصف الأمامي اللي سألوا باللغة العربية لأن أتوقع هي لغتنا وما في أي مانع أن نفتخر بلغتنا ونسأل بلغتنا فأتمنى أن بما أن وجود التكنولوجيا هنا تسخر لنا أن نترجم اللغات كيف ممكن أن نحوي أن نغني المحتوى العربي وشكرا لك yeah. Great question. Um, so it was about how can we enrich Arabic content on the web um, by, you know, making more of it. You know, I think that what's interesting about content is that content lives in a marketplace. I and mean, we live now in an attention economy. So whatever gets the most clicks, whatever's resonating the most, gets shared the most, whatever gets shared the most, gets seen the most. Um, I get contacted a lot by people who say they would like to. It's not, you can't hear. Oh. I get, tra I get contacted a lot by people who say that they want to, uh, maybe bring me a handheld. <laughs> people who say that they want to subtitle my shots of awe, which I say, absolutely, go for it. People have subtitled it to Spanish as well. I think that what gets lost in translation and the nuances of language is definitely a problem. Thanks. Okay. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, but I think what's very exciting is that there's a lot of real-time translation technologies that are coming online. I saw a Google app once that you can use the camera on your phone and you can put it over, let's say, a restaurant menu that's written in Arabic or Spanish. And the software actually changes the words so that through the camera on your phone, in real time, will display in the language that you can understand. But when you think of what language is, language is still a very rudimentary tool to convey meaning, right? To convey what's inside our heads. I mean, language is little noises, symbolic meaning that we make using air and using our throats, and we send the air vibrating through space, and we hope that we understand each other. But one of my favorite philosophers, Terence McKenna, says that when virtual reality becomes full on, the revolution of full immersive virtual reality, when we can literally step inside of our imaginations, that language will become visual. Because when I say to you something, I say, okay, let me explain. But really what I want is to show you what I mean. 
So when language becomes visual in virtual reality, I will be able to visually show you what I mean. We will be able to share the insides of our mind as something that we can look at. That's, I think, the promise of virtual reality. That's why I think it's such a tool for empathy. Some friends of mine from the United Nations, they went to a Syrian refugee camp, and they made a virtual reality film called Clouds Over Sidra that basically was 360 degrees full immersive virtual reality to show you what it was like inside a refugee camp. And they played the film with the helmets, with the goggles, everything, to diplomats in the United Nations. And most of them would come out of the experience crying. Something that maybe if they saw a normal film, they wouldn't have reacted the same way. So I think as a tool for empathy and what's known as intersubjectivity, which is my ability to experience your mind and your ability to experience my mind, is going to be radically enhanced by virtual reality. And it's going to allow, I think, humans to be so much more, uh, it's going to reduce the conflicts that happen when we are not understanding each other and when we are not communicating. Because our dream, really, is to become one. And when we become one is when we understand each other. And I think that that's what a lot of these technologies could be helpful for. So thank you. One more question. Hello. Uh, my name is Mohamed Shamsi. I'm the robotics expert here in UAE. Uh, I'm only worried about technology. Uh, the new generation are now focusing more on using technology than using their best computer and their brain. They don't now, I, I can see from the, the new kids, they start playing with the technology and using the information. They don't even think of adding one to one is equal to. They're always looking in this system. So how we can improve their, uh, and uh, uh, make them think, use their brain more than using the technology or using both in the, in the right way. Thank you. So, yeah, the question, the question echoes some of what we've heard before is the concerns that if we're over-relying on these tools, you know, that some people are not even learning how to do one plus one. I think you raise a valid point. At the same time, 100 years ago in the United States, 90% of the workforce was farmers. That means that 100 years ago, all the children probably learned all these skills related to farming. They all knew how to graze the land. They all knew how to plant. The and that was a skill that was required for the time. Today, it's less than 1% of the U.S. workforce that does farming. What that means is probably none of the kids today are learning farming skills. You could, you could argue that that's a tragedy because, wow, how are they going to survive if they have to farm? But the truth is we already live in a world where we are interdependent with our technologies. It's just, it's just where we live. And so... If farming is not necessary, I think we should use our brains for something maybe that's more useful for us to be successful in the world. That doesn't mean we shouldn't learn mathematics. I still think there's basic knowledge that should be passed down and should be taught. But I think when we consider these technologies as separate from us, we make a mistake. I think we need to think of them now as part of the cognitive machinery. Part of us is biological. Part of us is non-biological. Human is all of it together. That's what I think. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Dubai. Thank you, Knowledge Summit. Always amazing to be here with you guys. Thank you. Uh, well, would love to thank Mr. Jason Will uh, Selfia for this nice conversation with us. وصلنا للختام لكم منا أجمل الأمنيات شكرا لحضوركم فعاليات قمة المعرفة نلقاكم إن شاء الله العام المقبل نستودعكم الله ونراكم على ابتكار نجاح تميز يا أسعد شعب في أمان الله